thank you, Susan, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so this is a piece of work that I kind of did by accident, and um, I was looking at radio common dates in the early Neolithic, and it, we were talking this morning. It, it's very interesting because we've got two main ways of, of looking at radio carbon dates at the moment, um, which are um, which I'll, I'll, I'll go into. So we've got some probability and we've got the Bayesian analysis. And so I'm going to talk about those, um, those methods and the theoretical steps that are involved in each um, and discuss uh, the anomalous dates in the elliptic contexts that I've come across and suggest um, an interpretation that's based on that. Now, with working with radiocarbon dates, um, the Bayesian analysis allows us to um, look at the parametric estimates of likely start and end dates in a very discrete and defined way. But the dates as data approach, or the uh, summed probability analysis, and this is something that Stephen Shannon's been doing a lot of, both in his cultural evolution project and he's continuing with his Neomind project, actually puts the dates in and shows the density of activity as a continuous function of time. Uh, but they deal with the, the odd data in quite different ways. And I think it's worth just spending a couple of minutes looking at that. Now, I've, in my draft, I put this as mashing dates one. And I sat there this morning and I thought, can I put it analysing dates? Should I put it in a different way? But actually, again, our terms are quite loaded. And I think I, I felt like I wanted to keep in mashing in because it's, you know, we're pushing it all together and trying to make sense of it. So the summed probability analyses, they put all the dates in. So they put in historic dates with large standard deviations, and um, they don't really take out error dates. Because what they're trying to do is say, look, we've got lots and lots of dates, and if we put them all together, we're going to be able to see peaks of intensity of activity. So even if you've got a date that's way off, it's not really going to impact on those peaks. It's it, it might provide a little uh, nubbin within that, that scale, um, but they're not really interested in taking out individual dates. So th they just tend to be involved. So um, this is a slide from the Collard et al. Um, paper in 2010, which you may have seen, you may not have seen. And this is the other thing that's quite interesting, is that while the Bayesian analyses do tend to be published in archaeological literature, this kind of stuff goes, tends to go into nature or goes into the more science um, publications. And they don't tend to go through the kind of peer review, that, an archaeological peer review, if you like. So you can see here that, um, well, I say they put all the dates together. They have still made theoretical steps with deciding what is a monument and what isn't a monument. So they're able to show where there's monuments, what are the dates without monuments, and the serial um, data only. So that is, there is, in this particular expression of it, there's still an interpretation that's, that's coming in there. And I'll come to, back to that later. But in terms of Bayesian analysis, we're looking at these event-based narratives. And you know, nobody is saying that they're not event-based. It's like totally classic. Bayesian statistics are about producing dates of events. And they do this by looking at anom anomalous dates and either completely excluding them or assigning a low probability weighting to that date. So um, there's an interpretive use within that of saying, no, that date is wrong. That date is, we're not going to, it's not applicable to the research question under investigation, so we're not going to include it. So of course you'll all be familiar with this, which is um, where we, where Gathering Time produced a detail of where they think the uh, course read enclosure, well this is the start of the Neolithic course, where that's coming in at different dates um, across southern Britain. So we're getting that sense of regionality that we don't um, perhaps get as much with the summed probability analyses until that's very constrained. It occurred to me, um, listening to Susan's paper, that what's interesting when we look at the display of, of dates 
in terms of, uh, we do have them all listed in gathering time, we've got dates and they do say what's excluded and what isn't. The sum to probability analyses, they um, do tend to publish the dates and, and everything quite widely and there are databases online. So if, I, if any of you haven't come across the Radon database, it's run out of the University of Kiel. They've got a lot of the radiocarbon dates out of Northern Europe. Um, and they're also available on the UCL website from the library. Um, the databases, Excel databases, that Shannon's Cultural Evolution Project used. And in that, they signed um, sites to various numbers and you can track through. Um, it's quite hard work, but you can do it. So in terms of these data sets, they are quite different. And I think that that's, um, it's useful to, to, to state that because in some ways I've become a little more of a fan of the sum to probability um, than I thought I would be, which is quite interesting. So in terms of the um, event-based analyses, I've been quite, um, when I started to think about Bayesian in terms of event-based analysis, I realised that we have had quite a shift over the last 15 years to look at things as event-based. And that's not just in radiocarbon terms, um, but in terms of structured deposition and even individual artefacts. And so, certainly within the British Neolithic, we're not only looking at date events, we're looking at artefact events, or you know, in, in some people's work, specific depositional events, that are then extrapolated to explain the whole of that society. And it's quite interesting um, that we're at that point. Um, but I think that these have restricted the questions that we ask of the archaeological record. That event-based, event um, you know, what kind of interpretation do we have when we string events together? And how useful is that? And that perhaps we need to be broadening our questions. So. There are some very odd dates um, that I came across when I was trying to find the earliest Neolithic dates and I could see that certain things were being excluded and it was quite interesting. So I'm going to take you through some of those now. Now you'll all probably be aware of the, the early dates at Partly Frost Crum, um, which is Chamber Tomb. And we have here two dates, one that's coming in just over um, 10,000 BC and another one that's around about 7,500 and the very early date was on what's classed as a large ungulate bone um, and the other one was originally um, thought to be a dog bone um, and it was dated but it then appears it's been reanalyzed and thought to be a badger so it was thought that um, these old this material had come from a nearby cave so that's okay We've got that, that so, but as you can see, all the other dates are post 4000. Um, but we also have some evidence at Ascot and Witchwood, where we have dates which are over 5000 and again around about 4500. Now, these are, um, we don't have direct evidence of cave involvement here, um, but well, we did into the excavation report. But work done subsequently by um, Smith and, and Brickley on the evidence um, uh, on this assemblage, they found a little fossil, th uh, they found what they called a cave straw. So this is something, it's a stalactite, a geological, geological kind of thing that you find in caves that had been incorporated into that material. And also the original report that was done by Chesterton noted that there was some kind of cave tufa on one of the skulls but that didn't seem to have been picked up by anybody else afterwards. So I think that again at Ashcott and Witchwood, we can you know, argue that perhaps we've got cave material coming in here. So these dates are being, of course, in terms of assumed probability, well, I'll come to that. So, but these aren't the only dates, again. So we have some more at Crickley Hill, where we've got a date, um, this is actually about 4,200. And we have this again at burnt ground. Um, it's interesting then when we come to think about the early Neolithic, are we saying that these structures are actually dated earlier or are we dating deposits or you know, how are we thinking about these in more detail? But of course those monuments are um, early Neolithic, around about 3700, 
But it does continue. Um, so there were these anomalous dates from the Dorset's Cursus. So these dates are from Bradley's work, where this is effectively the same context, where we have two dates that are coming through, um, again, 5,500 and 6,000. Now, of course, the, the Bayesian um, analyses have said these dates are just wrong, OK? They're wrong, they're anomalous, we'll chuck them out. Um, but actually, if you think about the methodologies that are used for um, the, the chemical way of doing radiocarbon dates, I think that you would expect the dates to be very wrong. So there is a date that's come out of Maiden Castle that's 30,000 BP. You know, if we're getting a lab error or something, we should have something within quite a massive range and perhaps not something um, that's, that seems to be, you know, within, certainly in some deposits uh, where we've only got a few hundred years difference, maybe, you know, a wrong date is a wrong date. We maybe should have um, a, a wider scheme of that. Many of these dates um, have been argued to be part of residuality. Now, it's quite interesting when I looked at the um, data on residuality in archaeological context, because it seems to be something that's much more prevalent in town contexts and medieval contexts and Roman towns where you're having maybe deposits dug into and, and then they, earlier material becomes part of the backfill of later material. When we get to the early Neolithic and monuments, this residuality is assuming that there was an earlier archaeological feature that has been completely destroyed and that material has been incorporated into the monument, into that deposit. And I think what that means is that um, we are, we're imagining activity there. So it, it brings a kind of emergent Neolithic at that beginning. So it does situate that um, pre-Neolithic material in that location. And that's quite important when we're looking at the development of um, the Neolithic in terms of where, you know, how, where the new way of life, if you like, starts. And I wanted to bring this up um, because, of course, this is the summed probability. And um, I've spoken to Stephen Shannon about this. He's very generous and allowed me to giggle about it. Because, of course, what it means, I'm sorry about the camera, is that we're getting monumental activity here. We see with monuments, that dark splodge is basically saying we've got monuments coming through at 6,500. Um, so what this, you know, we're having a, um, and I said, well, we don't, you know, what, how, how can we have that? And those are those early dates poking through within the summed probability analysis. So when I went back to look at the dates, of course, we date things in Neolithic context that we think are going to be Neolithic. So if we have, um, um, this is the table from um, my work, and most of them are um, either human bone or deer or cattle bone. So, of course, those are the materials that we would date in the Neolithic to try and date the Neolithic. Um, but I think what's interesting, I didn't put a slide up <coughs> again, I wasn't too sure at the time what I'd have. Um, whilst we know there's this older curated material in the ditch at Stonehenge, there's also some interesting earlier dates um, in Sars and Stonehold 27. So on the right, that should be dated to 2600 to 2400, but it's actually coming through at around about 4300 4, to 4000. Um, but even down the Grimes Graves report, the wonderful work that Francis Healy did, there's an early antler at 4500 to 4300 in one of the pits that's dated 2800 to 2400. So this isn't something that's simply happening in certain monuments at certain times, but it's, it seems to be something that's cropping up throughout the record. Thank you very much. Oh dear. And so I've thought that instead of assuming that these dates are wrong, that we're actually looking at something um, that I'm calling cultural reclamation. So we have the deliberate inclusion of old material into new contexts. So I think that this is, rather than something that's a dating error, is actually indicative of cultural practice. If we imagine it as a cultural practice, it's Neolithic, people in the Neolithic going to caves, perhaps going to middens that they can find, and taking material out. 
and putting that into the new monuments that they're putting forward. Now, of course, we don't know how long these older materials could be in circulation and what kind of events would have, you know, how we would identify those now um, with, you know, we don't have many existing Mesolithic middens, though we do have obviously caves where we get a, a huge amount of material. The bones you can see there, one is a fresh um, sheep bone and the other one is a 2,000 year old bone from a cave. So this is again the other point really in the temporality of these deposits, that while we might not recognise these bones as being different now, 4,000 or 6,000 years later, at the time of their deposition they would have looked quite different. And if you look back to um, Binford's work and actually um, Michael Schiffer's work looking at that whole um, the CNN transforms that's something that we can maybe begin to envisage with this kind of material so we've got some things that are reclaimed and residual and redeposited but they are looking at the time quite different and perhaps we're not engaging with that um, or we're not looking for it in a way that we should be during bone analysis. And finally, it did make me wonder, whilst we do have a bias in dating the cattle or deer bone, was there a desire to get those bones out of old context to legitimise Neolithic practices of farming at that time? And I think that's quite interesting if there is a selection of old material that's going on, and they would have been very familiar with carcasses and bones and, and um, of the different animals they use. But do we are we seeing different points where there is some sort of social tension that is prompting this kind of reclamation and this kind of action? So, in a sense, that would be a sort of cultural reappropriation of the past, a way of reforming the Mesolithic into something that was more familiar in the Neolithic. And so, in conclusion, there's nothing wrong with the big dates, uh, big data, or some probability analysis, or the Bayesian stuff. Um, but the when doesn't always elucidate the how or why. And I think those are some of the really interesting questions in archaeology. And I think rather like Susan was saying this morning, we need to have a look at these alternatives to rejection and have a feedback loop into the data analysis. So we can say these don't fit, what else could they say? And so I'd just like to say thank you. And um, I've been helped being pushed to some earlier dates by Andrew Julian and Thank you very much.